So I want to start this video with uh, a problem. And the problem is that you know, orbitals often don't have the correct symmetry for bonding. In order to make uh, a bond, atomic orbitals must be of the same symmetry uh, in order to form bonding and then anti-bonding orbitals. And uh, if, if you don't have uh, the same symmetry, what this means, um, as we've seen, right, is that essentially you are, are orthogonal in the symmetry space. So if you have an orbital of A1 symmetry, you cannot make a bond of, with an orbital, another orbital of, let's say, A2 symmetry. Those are um, orthogonal symmetries. And so if you look at the um, integral that describes the overlap, the, basically the, the bond, okay, that's going to be zero if you have two different types of symmetry. And so um, what people have tried to do, do in particular Linus Pauling, um, what he did was he tried to bridge VSEPR and quantum mechanics in this way to overcome this problem. And so um, here is, is an example. Take methane, very simple, right, uh, molecule. We know it has tetrahedral symmetry. Uh, we know that we have carbon-hydrogen bonds. We have four carbon-hydrogen bonds. We know that uh, we're, we need to make uh, bonds between the 1s orbitals of hydrogen. That's where the valence electron is in hydrogen. It's in the 1s orbital. And then we have uh, four valence electrons, right, in carbon. But the um, orbitals, atomic orbitals on carbon, on the central atom, that are available for bonding are those in the valence shell. So that's the n equals two state. So you have the 2s, the 2px, the 2py, and the 2pz, right? And the idea is that we're going to um, make overlap between the s orbital on hydrogen, um, and there's gonna be two electrons in each of these bonds, um, and that's gonna give carbon an octet. So effectively, um, in the new orbitals that form, right, that form from the 2s, 2px, 2py, 2pz, there's now eight electrons there completing the octet and everything's happy. The problem is that the four hydrogen atoms have their, their spheres, right? The, the atomic orbitals are spheres. They're 1s orbitals. Those have A1 symmetry. It's totally symmetric. Um, and you can prove this because you can do anything to a sphere. Do identity on a sphere, you're going to get a sphere, sphere back. Uh, you do a 120-degree rotation, a C3 on a sphere, you get a sphere back. 180 degree rotation, you get a sphere back, right? An improper rotation, get a sphere back, et cetera. A, a, a dihedral a reflection, you get a sphere back. So it translates, a sphere translates as ones across the board. So one S atomic orbital, or any S atomic orbital actually, uh, always translates as the totally symmetric representation. And so in, T, in TD uh, point group, that's the A1 irreducible representation. Here's the problem. You can make a bond with the 2s orbital. That's all good, because that's also a sphere. So you have A1, 2s on carbon, and A1, symmetry of the 1s on hydrogen. The problem is the 2ps, okay? The 2ps um, have a symmetry of T2, okay? As we'll, we'll learn in detail in the next chapter, uh, atomic orbitals, uh, like the px, atomic orbital, has the same symmetry as an x vector. And it, it kind of looks like an x vector here, okay? And the py has the same symmetry as the y vector, the pz has the same symmetry as the, the z vector. This is part of what makes the character table so powerful in um, describing the symmetry of bonding. But anyway, so you can see that uh, in TD, x, y, and z uh, transform together as T2. So the, T, P, the, the two Ps, the three two Ps, Px, Py, Pz, they have two T symmetry. And so you can't form any bonds there. Those are different symmetries. Uh, so all you can do with the atomic orbitals, according to group theory, um, is form uh, one bond, one carbon-hydrogen bond between 1s and the 2s. And the 2px and the 2py and the 2pz can't do anything. That's what group theory um, states, and that, in fact, is completely true. Obviously, we have four bonds in methane, so something's you know, totally awry here, and it is, 
Um, and so what Linus Pauling did was he invented the concept of hybrid orbitals. He said that essentially you have an S uh, orbital and it mixes with three P's, right? And it makes four SP3 uh, hybrid orbitals. And these have the correct symmetry now to undergo bonding with the hydrogen atoms, okay? Now, the problem is that these hybrid orbitals don't actually exist, okay? And we'll see in the next chapter that um, there's good experimental evidence that shows that this is totally wrong, okay? Specifically, looking at the photoelectron spectrum of methane um, shows you that uh, you don't have four equal uh, orbitals, okay? They're, they're molecular orbitals and they're different, there's different types of molecular orbitals that together stitch together um, all five of the atoms in methane, okay? So hybrid orbitals, you know, I hate to burst your bubble if you really like hybrid orbitals, but, um, you know, it's a theory just like anything else, but it's a terribly bad theory. And, uh, you know, were you lied to in your introductory chemistry class? No, you weren't lied to. I wouldn't call this a lie, but you are taught a theory that is very bad. Um, and it's useful in some very limited circumstances in organic chemistry, but it gets a lot, a lot wrong, as we'll see. And so in general, hybrid orbitals just make us feel better. There's no physical basis for um, this. There's no wave function mixing that happens this way, quantum mechanically. Um, Linus Pauling just got stuck, and he came up with this idea to solve the problem. Okay. And so as you know, right, you make uh, three sp2 orbitals. If you're a trigonal planar uh, geometry, uh, linear has two sp's, and then you have the unhybridized py and pz. Again, all of this is sort of just a figment of originally Linus Pauling's imagination. Okay. And really the key experimental result, which again we'll go over in detail in the next chapter, is that the electronic structures as probed by both you know, modern day computations, but more importantly, um, spectroscopy, do not match the, the experiments uh, more often than not for hybrid or orbitals, certainly not for even something as simple as methane. Um, if you look at this picture, you would assume all four of these orbitals are the same. They're all sp3 orbitals, therefore they should all have the same energies. And that is actually not true of the molecular orbitals that tie this um, molecule together. The problem is, right, we draw methane as a Lewis structure, okay? And even drawing uh, methane as a Lewis structure is, um, that's a model, and that has certain validity, but as we see, we'll see, it has um, grave shortcomings as well, right? All of these look symmetric and sim the same here. But embodied in this, there's actually different molecular orbitals. They, they still have the same bond length, and it is indeed TD symmetry. Same bond angles, 109.5. But within here, the eight, eight electrons that are participating in bonding, they are distinct from one another, okay? There are different sets of energy within that. Um, and the Lewis structure cannot capture that in, in any meaningful way. And in fact, it implies Right, that everything is sort of the same. You have two electrons right here between this bond, two electrons right here between the bond, two electrons right here between the bond, two electrons right there be between the bond. Bonding is usually not that localized, okay? And that's what we'll see with um, MO theory once we get there in the next chapter. So that's all we have to do on um, VSEPR. You know, get practice coming up with the different VSEPR uh, structures. That should be fairly straightforward. And then, you know, become comfortable with explaining some of the shortcomings of VSEPR. Um, and also a little bit about uh, some of the theories that are used, empirical theories that are used to um, kind of enhance VSEPR, like the steric considerations.